Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. I'm still catching my breath. <laughs> oh, good morning, church. Good morning. Amen. Y'all, y'all warmed up. You got, you got it now. It's hot. It's hot. Has has anyone been here for all of these part of the uh, the series? Raise of hands. That's awesome. And and just look at what God's doing. If this is your first time here, I'm glad you're here. You can belong before you believe. I don't care if you're an atheist or a drug addict. I'm I'm, I'm glad you're here. You're in the right place. This probably all looks super crazy to you, and now it looks even crazier that there's a guy with tattoos and knuckle tattoos and, and, and all that jazz going on, but uh, we're here to, to proclaim the word of God and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Y'all, look, I'm so excited. I went to the wrong, wrong uh, bookmark in my Bible. So if you haven't been here for all of these, I'm in the middle of a series called Committed, out of Second Chronicles in the life of Jehoshaphat. Again, if you've missed it last week or whatever week I said it, if you're pregnant, that is a name that's probably not very much, uh, very well chosen, chosen. So, you know, you can always go with that. Um, but we started in the life of Jehoshaphat. We started with, uh, with a series I call them episodes instead of weeks, just because I didn't know how long it was going to go. So episode one was renewal, about uh, renewing our walk, our covenant with God, the, the cry for the state of the church in mainly America, but also the world, because we've slipped away into just uh, watered down milk and cookies kind of gospel where nobody's truly getting fed and we're just starving for the truth. Week two was a relapse where we've set our hearts on God and unfortunately something came up. The honeymoon phase was over and we've had a little relapse. We had a little setback, but we're still trying and some things happened last week. What was last week? The rejection. Look at that. I, pre- I was, whoo, drew a blank. Rejection was where we continued in Second Chronicles chapter 18. We were there for two weeks uh, and that was rejection because... There was 400 false prophets that spoke to Jehoshaphat and spoke to Ahab, and they uh, misled them. And then Micaiah, the true prophet of the Lord, came in, and he told them, you know, if you go, Ahab, you're going to die. This is basic. This is God's judgment against you. They rejected the word of the Lord, which is where we find ourselves now very much, very often in America, rejecting the word of the Lord, uh, because we want to tickle our ears and feel good instead of being convicted and making sure that we're holy and righteous and can step foot into heaven with Jesus. Oh, I feel that. I feel that this morning. So this week, episode four, committed, chapter 19 of 2 Chronicles, this week is the return. The return, it's a very short chapter. No, that does not mean I'm going to preach even shorter. (laughs) I always over-prepare, and I feel like I under-deliver because I bring so much. Um, I am looking forward to finding the right word that God wants me to bring, and I want to do a Friday night fire kind of revival type of thing soon, and just uh, pull the brakes off, and let's come in here and worship God without boundaries. Let's come in here and worship without time limits, and just soak in his presence, whether that's worship or the word. You can come in whenever you want, and leave whenever you want. It's going to happen. I just don't have a date set. If you're joining us online, let me know where you're watching from. I love to hear where people are coming from. Does anybody think they're here from the farthest away this morning? Nobody. I have a buddy that drove from Orlando this morning. I don't know where you're at in here because there's a lot of faces. Where are you from? They're pointing at you. Somebody's singling you out. Where are you from, ma'am? Arizona. Arizona. Woo! That's beautiful. Thank you for joining us. Um, If we can, please stand for the reading of the Word of God. I know your feet are tired from running through my mind all week. Y'all love it. They love the cheesiness. Um, we did not stand for the entire time, so just give me a few moments for the reverence of God's word. Starting in verse 1 of 19, I'm just going to read three passages and let's, I'm ready to go to work. Is that all right with you guys? Amen. 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 <clears throat> verse 1, when Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned safely 
to his palace in Jerusalem. If you don't know what happened before here, uh, like I said, they ignored and rejected the word of the Lord. They went out into war against Ramoth Gilead. Ahab was killed. Jehoshaphat was spared. I don't think I got to it last week. Uh, He cried out to God, and God delivered him, made the enemies flee from pursuing him. So now he has returned safely in a different state that he was before. Verse two, Jehu, the seer, the son of Hanani, went out to meet him and said to the king, should you help the wicked and love those who love, oh, excuse me, and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you. There is, however, some good in you. There's some good in you. As dirty as we all are and as fallen as we all are and in the sinful nature we are, there is some good in you. In you, for you have rid the land of the Asherah poles and have set your heart on seeking God. Woo! Father, mm, I feel the Holy Spirit already. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence. I pray this word convicts us all, starting with me. We need a return, God. We need a revival. We need your fire. I pray for fire, for anointing, for wisdom. I pray this word. <clears throat> does not return void. God, break the sickness off of us. Break the, break the demons off of us, God. Let them flee this building if they were somehow able to get past the doorways. Y'all pray for me while I'm praying for you. I pray, God, right now that the, that the Holy Spirit convicts their, their hearts, God, that it strikes truth into them and they go out into the world prepared and fed and ready to make disciples, God, like the Great Commission to continue the gospel, to further the gospel, to awaken America, God. Awaken in their hearts and stir up your spirit within them, Jesus. Woo! Mm. I am your vessel, God. Speak through me. Wipe the floor with my agenda and hijack this service. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Oh, y'all feel it. My Lord. So my rip, you can be seated. I'm sorry. I'm not used to the pleasantries. <clears throat> I mean, if y'all want to stand up with me, be, be, be my guest. Um, my original title for this message was Rebuke and Revival. Uh, that doesn't sound as sexy, so we're going with return. Um, because this passage, as we see, Jehu comes in and he offers a rebuke to Jehoshaphat. And later in the passage, it brings about revival. Um, And the whole point of this series, it began from me wanting to preach, feeling led to preach chapter 20. If you go to chapter 20, that's where we will be next week. Uh, The first two words are after this. So a good student of the text. You all right over there? (laughs) A good... (laughs) After this. So a good student of the text is immediately going to say, after what? So... Me doing my due diligence, I went back and uh, I started it in chapter 16 and went ahead and here we are today in, in 19. Uh, I pray it's, it's touching y'all's heart, it's, it's touching mine. I've gone back and watched the messages and, and cried over them myself. Uh, and I don't mean that out of like arrogance or anything like that. They just, it, it spoke to me. A lot of times it's uh, just flown in the Holy Spirit up here. I don't even know what I'm saying. And then we get there. But the point that I wanted to do today with the title of return, and I think we can all agree on this, is that we need a return to the to the Lord. We need a return to the Lord in this land. I'm I'm thankful that we're seeing states beginning to put the Bible back in their schools, to put the yes, praise God, to put the Ten Commandments back in their schools. Uh, The demonic forces. Whether you believe this or not, and you, you will one day, <laughs> whether it's now or in the next life, uh, the demonic forces against us are great, but greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And everything that comes against us in this life, in the physical, has to pass through the spiritual first. So I, I don't know if you guys have seen this uh, recently, but with revival, and revival one of the definitions is a renewed attention to or interest in something. 
So when we're speaking of revival, we're renewing our hearts, renewing our minds and our souls for the God, letting, for God, letting him reignite the fire that is within us. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, but in Ohio, at one of their college campuses, the Buckeyes, they recently had, are you from Ohio? That's awesome. Have you seen this? I don't know why I'm pointing out my notes like you can see it, but <laughs> I'm still dealing with a cough, so y'all forgive me. Uh, Ohio Buckeyes, their college football team, they just started a revival on campus, and there was thousands of people that were showing up. They were getting baptized, and not only was uh, the team sharing their testimony and baptizing people, they also took them into different rooms and taught them about discipleship and the importance of it. And actually, it's hilarious, as I was looking it up, uh, I, I saw one of the, the negative comments against it. This guy was just blasting them on their page. And um, he was saying that it, it, it wasn't true because it was organized. So there was no Holy Spirit there because it was already the Christians that were doing the revival. It was organized by Christians, put on by Christians. And my thought on that is the Holy Spirit can still take structure and bring about spontaneous spontaneous. Just because something is organized, look at, the, look at the first five books of the Bible that so many of us often skip because it's a bunch of rules and laws and regulations. God is a God of order. He is a God of structure. When you put yourself into getting organized and creating structure, that is worship to our Father. And then there's another one, if you guys remember, that was going on in Asbury, where there is, this was a town, y'all think the traffic's bad here. Uh, there's a town of 6,000 people that saw anywhere from 50 to 70,000 people come in for this revival that started. And it was so overwhelming, it pretty much broke their infrastructure, all because people were hungry for an encounter with Jesus Christ. Mm. So where we begin today... Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, he returned safely, safely. As I told you a moment ago, he was defeated in battle. He's coming back different than he was before. He was devoted to God, but he was still defeated in battle. I think some of us have been there before where we're, we're, we're focused on pressing into Jesus and we're devoted to Jesus, but we still feel defeated in some type of way. But the Bible, oh, it's so beautiful. The Bible says you can be hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. You can be perplexed, but not in despair. If you know it, say it with me. Persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. You could have been doing the wrong thing things with the wrong group but God. But God. The people that know, that stirs something up in your spirit. You were with the wrong group, but God. God still brought you out of it. He still brought you through it. You could have been shooting up. You could have been snorting. You could have been drinking. You could have been having sex with everybody that you imagined. You could have been sinning every which way that you could have imagined. But God still brought you here to this room safely because you've got a calling over your life. You've got a purpose over your life. And God's not done with you yet. Oh. So he returns. He was devoted, but he has been defeated. I am feeling the Lord this morning. And Jehu, the seer, the son of Hanani. If you remember this, I spoke briefly on this in the beginning of our series that Jehoshaphat was the son of Asa. Okay? Uh, he was the previous king before Jehoshaphat in Judah, and he started out okay, stumbled near the end of his life. Jehoshaphat, he starts out okay, he makes an, uh, an unholy alliance with Ahab, and as we'll see today, he does get a rebuke, he is to have a revival. Can y'all start my countdown so I don't go too crazy long today, please? Um, thank you. Now y'all get extra time. <clears throat> so he gets the rebuke, he gets the rebuke. From uh, Let me back up here. Okay, so Jehoshaphat, we'll do a little family tree. Jehoshaphat, son of Asa. Asa was rebuked by Hanani for much the same reason. He got a rebuke, and how he responded with, was with anger, and he throws Hanani in prison. 
Jehoshaphat, Asa's son, the one that threw Hanani in prison. Hopefully this isn't too confusing to follow. Jehoshaphat gets rebuked by Jehu, who is the son of Hanani. This is a continuation of the flow. You've got two, the, the son and the father and the son and the father. One gets rebuked, sends the other one to prison. One gets rebuked, and he doesn't retaliate by throwing him in prison. He responds. He responds. It's how you respond because this response shows true repentance. And that is the point of all of this, to repent, to turn from your sins, to turn to Jesus, to recognize your need for a Lord and Savior. And if you don't yet, that's fine. You will one day. And I pray that repentance finds you before judgment does. I don't mean that uh, hypocritically or to try to scare you into a walk with the Lord. But one day this will click for you. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And I pray to Jesus that you're doing it this side of eternity, this side of the dirt nap. The dirt nap. And he tells him, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? The Message Bible, I love this. In the Message Bible, it says, you have no business helping evil, cozying up to God haters. Woo, that's heavy. I know a lot of us, we want to try to uh, slip in and have a little excuse with, oh, well, I'm, you know, I don't, I, I love these people. I know, I know they're not walking with the Lord. My husband's not walking with the Lord. My, wife, my wife's not rock, walking with the Lord. But, you know, I'm going to lead them to Jesus one day. And that's, that's different than what this is. And you have to be careful with that when you get unequally yoked with someone that they don't pull you, I see you now, while they don't pull you back into problems, why they don't pull you back into evil, why they don't, uh, you see this with drug addicts when often, I was talking with Jason about this earlier, when they get out of, of prison or rehab and they end up reconnecting with someone that's still in that lifestyle and it drags them back into it. This is the point that you don't want to cozy up with God haters, pray for them, pray for them, pray with them, don't party with them. When you start living like they're living just because you want to reach them for Jesus, you start compromising your values, you start compromising your morals, and you start slipping into apostasy, and next thing you know, you look exactly like they do. And they pulled your identity back into what they're still in instead of you lifting them out and pointing them to Jesus. It's how you respond. It's how you respond with repentance. And we'll get in this later, but... Helping evil. This is not judgmentalism. Right. Not judgmentalism. And we'll get there in a minute. But I love this that he says in verse 3, there is, however, some good in you. The people that have a testimony know how this feels. To be on the wrong side and come to Jesus and feel the pressure of conviction. And I posted this on, on, on Facebook. You can keep Christianity and you will feel the pressure of conviction. You will feel the fire burning things off of you and refining you. Or you can abandon Christianity and you can feel the freedom right. There's no freedom living in the world. Right. There's none. It's, it's completely false. Completely false. People think that the word of the Lord is nothing but a bunch of rules. I don't want your God. I don't want your religion because it's just a bunch of rules. This is not about rules. This is about relationship. Everything was set as boundaries in order to keep us safe. This is why, oh, this is why I implore you so often to get in this book and, and not just get a concordance. Don't just read the words that we see in English because you're missing the intricacies of the original text, the original language, the original meaning and intention. And there's, there's nothing wrong with the English translations that we have. Yes, there's some that you should watch out for and steer away from. But in order to study the Bible, you've got to do a lot more than just see what it says. You've got to actually see what it says. Does that make sense? You've got to dig down deep into it. It's like dating your wife or your spouse. 
You're not gonna know anything about them unless you take the time to look into them, to learn what makes them tick. And God, God is not happy with you just reading your Bible and coming to church. God is not happy with you just raising your arms in worship. God is happy when you actually want him. Not what he has to offer you, not just what he says. Some of y'all, you're not understanding what I'm saying. It's not that God is angry at you. He wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want to be a roommate with you and share this life with you. He wants the, the, the entirety of your being to be completely devoted to him in every step, in every facet of your walk. He wants you to stay committed to him. And we see there's some good in you, but there's still a wrath. You messed up, you slipped up. There's some good in you, but the wrath of the Lord is still on you. There's still consequences to your sin. God loves you, and he will convict you. He will lead you to repentance. If you reject him, eventually your heart will be hardened. That is the unpardonable sin. Being hardened against God, rejecting him, rejecting his, his commandments, rejecting his, uh, the, the, the voices that he sends into your life, rejecting his conviction, and you reject him so much that eventually, like Pharaoh in Exodus, he says, all right, have your way. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. I love the saying when we get in heaven that there will be two responses to God. Thy will be done, or he will look at you and say, thy will be done. There's cotton that is terrifying. But he's full of love. He's full of grace. And no matter where you are, the minute you turn back to him, he is already running at you, ready to accept you into his arms as you are. Not to stay there, but to accept you as you are. There's probably people in this building right now that have been completely church hurt. And I want to get rid of that term because it's not church hurt, it's people hurt. Hurt people, hurt people. We are the problem. We are the problem. We set ourselves up on pedestals. We idolize people behind the pulpit. We idolize people with a microphone, whether that's worship or in the worldly music. We idolize people because we want to prop ourselves up to where God is instead of realizing I'm not on his level. I'm supposed to bow my face to the ground because I know I'm not worthy enough to him. I'm not worthy. He is worthy of my worship. I'm not worthy of anything in this life, but he has given me everything I have simply because of his grace. Whether you believe in him or not, he can still and will still bless you. This is why you see people completely atheistic and walking and blaspheming God, but they're still blessed. But we don't like that. And we see there's consequences to your sin. You can't just live out how you want to live out. You can't just do that. There's consequences but like this, and we see today, God always provides the way out. God always provides the way out. You've got consequences for your actions, but God always provides the way out. You could have been a drug addict, but Jesus stepped into your life. You could have been an alcoholic, but Jesus stepped into your life. You could have been a womanizer, but Jesus stepped into your life. You could have been a religious... Uh, bigot, but Jesus finally, hopefully, steps into your life. You could have been a knucklehead, sinning every which way. You could have been a gangbanger. You could have been a drug dealer. You could have been a prostitute, but Jesus stepped into your life and changed you for the better. He washed you with his blood, made you white as snow, and has forgiven your sins. I thought y'all would be much more excited about the fact that you've been cleaned up, you've been saved, you've been sanctified. I think it's about time we get back to giving God a little bit more glory for the things that he has done to us, for us, and through us. And I love this in verse 4. I know I didn't read it because I wanted to get in here. But it says, Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem. And he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim. That is the entirety of his kingdom. He said, I live here, but the people out there still need to know about my God. 
I live here. I come to church here. I come to family church here. I come to a local church wherever you're watching from. If you're visiting, if you're from Arizona or you're from Ohio, I live here, but they still need Jesus out there. It's not meant to be confined to these walls. It's not meant to be confined to just your heart. God changes you so you can go forth and make disciples. Do we remember Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission? <clears throat> The whole land. He goes out to the whole land. And I love this. I told you I'm big on words. He went out again. Again. If you remember, in 17, he was devoted to the Lord. So the Lord established his kingdom. The Lord blessed him. And then he sent out teachers of the law. And as soon as they went out, it brought the fear of the Lord on all the surrounding nations. And now he's doing it again. And I don't know who needs to hear that today. Do it again. Set your face to the Lord again. Do it again. Seek him again. You might have slipped this morning on the way to church. Seek him again. Do it again. You might have sinned right when you walked in the door. Do it. Not the sin. Seek him again. You might have sinned last night. You might still be drunk from the night before. You might still be high from the night before. Don't do that again. Seek him again. Find his face again because because he is looking for you. And the minute you start looking for him, he will find you. He will find you. He is chasing you. He is running after you. He desires you more than you can desire anything else in this world. And the things that we keep trying to fill our hearts with and stepping out and trying to fill it with video games and trying to fill it with Pornhub and trying to fill it with alcohol and trying to fill it with weed and trying to fill it with women and trying to fill it with drugs. He is the one that truly fills that hole and that void in your life. And the minute you get that grasp, he is the only thing that will ever satisfy you. That hole in you, the world just keeps eating it open and the only way you're ever going to fill it and close it up is with Jesus clothing you in glory. Oh, do it again. You've been set back. It's time to set your face back to him. See, the devil has you too focused on your mess instead of focusing on the Messiah. Some of y'all got really bad past and you're too focused on the past instead of the one who provided a way out of it. Some of y'all are focused on the mess more than you're focused on the Messiah that stepped in and said, I don't care how dirty you feel. I don't care how dirty you look. I don't care how messy your life is. You're clean when I say you're clean. And as soon as you accept Jesus, accept him as your Lord and Savior and follow him. And so where are y'all at this morning, family church? You sleeping. Jesus ain't sleeping. He's still working for you. He's setting you apart. He wants you to follow him and set your face to him. Don't let the enemy make you focus on your mess more than you're focused on the Messiah. And you know what this says? He went out again among the people from Beersheba Beersheba, to the hill country of Ephraim and turned them back. Turned them back. Turned them back. Chapter 17, he already sent people out to teach them. They were taught. Now they're turning back. You can come in here all you want, but revival isn't just reading the word of God. Revival is not hearing the word of God. Revival is a relationship with God. With God. A relationship with God. See, the problem... I'm going to offend somebody this morning. The problem is, with the American church, we keep treating Jesus as our mistress instead of our Messiah. And we keep wanting a Sunday sleepover telling Jesus, what can you give me? What can I get out of this? Let me just intimate intimate up with you. I'm going to be real. It's like we want to just come in... Oh, I don't mean this in like the wrong way, but it's like we want to come in and just have sex with God and then ditch him and ghost him and expect him to show back up the next week. If you got, well, I don't, if you got a girlfriend, better stop with it. If you got a wife, go try that. Go try that. Go cozy up with her and get what you want and then step back for a week and let me know how long your marriage lasts. It's going to go less. Because you're going to come knocking on the door next Sunday, and she might, uh-uh. 
You didn't date me. You didn't talk to me. You didn't have a relationship with me. You didn't take me out nowhere. You didn't buy me no flowers. But we want to treat God like, hey, I brought my Bible to church on this Sunday. What can you give me, God? How are you going to bless me this week? Can you get me out of this? Can you pay my bills this week? God, I can't get any, any groceries. I'm glad the church has the food pantry. And I'm glad we got a potluck this week. But hey, what can you give me out of this this week instead of what can I give you, God? What can I do for you, God? How can I serve you this week? Who can you put in my life so I can be bold and share the gospel and share the gospel? Who can I reach for you this week, God? Who can I share my testimony with? Who can you share your testimony with? Do you think you went through it for no reason? And it was just to build character? For what? So you could level up and have, you know, the the greatest costume in the battle pass on Fortnite or something? I heard it. (laughs) That's for the younger crowd. I got to hit all, I got to hit all ages. I'll figure y'all out some other time. I heard, I want to share it. I heard a great thing this morning about when God called Moses. If you remember this, uh, Exodus 4, 24 to 26, 23 to 26, it's Exodus 4. God calls Moses, if we know the story, Moses didn't want to do it. The stuttering prophet, the stuttering deliverer. Go pull these people out of Egypt. Now Moses was a Hebrew. He's already circumcised. Hopefully your kids are in children's church. (laughs) You ever read the passage in, in, in Exodus 4? They're going to Egypt to deliver him, to deliver the Israelites, excuse me. And God sets off and threatens to kill Moses. And we're like, this is the weirdest thing. I don't understand it. Moses had never consecrated his son. He had never circumcised his son. He had never truly set apart Moses at this point, was a hypocrite. And he could not be the leader that he needed to be unless he did this. And if we read between the lines and we read into the text, it is his wife that performs it, ouch, and then she touches his feet with the skin. This implies that Moses is possibly bedridden. So he's probably being judged with an illness on his way to die. And his wife goes and does what he should have already done. And I don't know who needs to hear this, and it might wreck your view of God a little bit, but sometimes God will hurt you in order to heal you. God will let you feel convicted so that you will know your calling is great. And if you're feeling the pressure and you're feeling pushed down and you're feeling crushed, that's because the size of the attack is the indicator of the size of the anointing over your life. So if you're feeling hell on every angle of your life and it's coming against you, and it's pushing you and it's squishing you and you're being buffed out like an arrow in his quiver, baby. And God is getting ready to pull back on that string and release you for what you're supposed to be doing in this world. God will let you get hurt just so you can find your allegiance to him. Who can you share your testimony with? Everyone. Someone and maybe you haven't found them yet, someone will benefit from what you went through. Probably so they won't have to. That's like mentorship. Mentorship is so you can get, um, you can get the, 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 the knowledge of experience without the pain of it. Does that make sense? If I, if I can go through something that took me five, 10 years to get through, but I can tell it to you in five minutes and save you from going through that, that is the point of your testimony. We're all human. We all screw up. I bet I have this week too. But in my private time, in my prayer life, I am saying, God, wring that out of me. Get rid of that sin. I have felt this way. This morning I was doing it. One of my, my favorite pastors, and I, I saw a comment on Facebook from this other guy that I follow, and he was, go, he was going to visit that church this morning, and I was like, I'm kind of jealous. And I was praying, I was like, God, that is the stupidest thing to get jealous over. 
I said, ring that out of me. Clean my heart up before I stand up in front of your people and tell them what you want to tell them. But we don't like rebukes because we want to feel good. We don't want to have somebody point out our sin. We want, we want to stay in our sexual immorality. We want to stay in our sin. Make me feel good and we can fill the seats up. I said it last week and I'll start harping it again. I don't care about filling up the seats. I want to fill your souls with the word of God. I want to feed your soul on the living, breathing, active word of God. That does not mean I do not care about you. That means I do care about you because I want you fed so your blood is not on my hands when we stand up before the judgment throne. The importance of the rebuke here and the importance of the rebuke in your life is for you to repent, turn from your sin, stop sinning. Repent doesn't mean, God, I'm sorry, I looked at that stuff at 3 a.m. and then you're looking at at it again at 3 a.m. this this morning. Repent is, I'm I'm putting a blocker on that website and I'm done. I'm disconnecting, I'm blocking those cell phone numbers from my group, you're not texting me anymore, I don't care if I need to check into rehab or Baker Act myself, I'm done living like this, God created me for more and I'm gonna move away from these people, I will disconnect and maybe possibly someday, Jesus, when you build my character enough and strengthen me enough, let me be the light in their life so they can see because they knew who I was so I can go forth and talk to them and lead them to you instead of continuing to live like I lived. Because God loves them just as much as he loves you. To repent and return. This is why you have to change your thinking. Change your mindset. Because when you realize that God cuts things off to prune you, when he removes things from your life to prune you, when he removes a relationship from your life to prune you, and you're stuck looking back on the boyfriend that really brought nothing to your life except for what he was bringing. You're more worried about him laying pipe instead of you getting down with God. I will be real. I will be raw. There's a lot of hell out there. You don't need to be coddled. You need to be convicted. I need to be convicted. But when you realize that God removes these things from you in order to strengthen you and propel you forward, you can change your thinking from realizing, I don't have losses. I have lessons. Everything is a lesson. Whatever God is removing from my life is indeed for my redemption. Whatever God is taking off of me is for the next part of my story, for the next part of what he's providing for me, or for providing for me to do, rather, providing for my purpose. I don't have losses. I have lessons. I got to quit sitting here talking about God. Why are you taking this away? Like it's a bad thing. Instead of God, why are you removing this from my life? What are you trying to get me to look at? What are you trying to get me to see so I can step further in my walk with you and reach someone else and share my testimony so I can return to you? I got to breathe. (laughs) And turned them back. They were taught, now they're turning. Turned them back. At the beginning of this, in the first of this series, in chapter 17, verse 6, the Bible says, his heart was devoted to God. This is why you need a concordance, and this isn't anything fancy what I'm about to say, but this is why you need to look at the words that are in the Bible. They are there for a specific reason. Somebody, oh, it's just written by men. Yeah, but it is breathed by God. This was written with the authority of your Lord, of your heavenly Father. It doesn't matter that it was written by men over a thousand years, over 1,500 years, and everything points to Jesus. Everything. There's no possible way that that happens without God. And there's how many manuscripts that prove that? You can prove the Bible with evidence without using the Bible. There's less manuscripts for history about like Caesar and other figures in history. But somehow we reject this as if it's a fable, even though it has more documentation than anything in this world. It is the most read book, the most uh, purchased book. It is also the most stolen book in history. For a reason. There's something in us that says, uh, this is real. 
But when you're in the world, you will reject it because your eyes are blinded by the devil. Because he got a grip on you. Because he got a grip on you. And it says in verse or, uh, chapter 17 that his heart was devoted to God. So now he needs to go out and share his testimony with these people. Because just because his heart is devoted to God doesn't mean their heart is devoted to God. Let me make it a little, a little bit more real with you. Just because there's teaching in a pulpit, just because there's preaching in a pulpit, doesn't mean it's reaching people's ears. And it doesn't mean the people are reaching for more truth. It doesn't even mean it is truth. Test it. Go home and test what I'm saying against this. Don't prop me up like everything I say is true and perfect. Test me. Make sure I am not above reproach. Make sure what you are hearing from whoever you are hearing it from, that it is out of this book. His heart was devoted to God, but their heart wasn't. And that's why when we start seeing biblical truth being preached, there's the two responses, only two. Both deal with turning. You either turn your face more towards God or you turn your back to him. The minute there is biblical truth that convicts you, that hurts you, that hurts me, we either turn our face to God and press in or we turn our back and leave the building. This is why I said the first week when I began preaching this way, this preaching either fills the room or it empties the room. Nothing to do with me, but we are starving for truth. Starving for truth. You're getting fed enough crap by CNN and Fox News and whoever else the other people are on the internet. Fact checkers and all this stuff and Zuckerberg and probably Elon Musk and everybody. They are, your best interest is not in their books. That's why I got kicked off of TikTok the other week for hate speech. Because we can preach cupcakes and rainbows, and we can dress up with cupcakes and rainbows, but the minute somebody stands up here and says before you, there's only two genders, and a man ain't wearing a dress, and doesn't need to wear a kilt either, if that's your culture, whatever, but you don't need to be putting on makeup just because you clothe yourself in one way, doesn't mean that's what you are on the inside. That's why Ahab got judged for his heart when he put on a disguise to avoid being defeated in battle. God don't care what you look like on the outside. He cares about what's going on in here, in the heart, on the inside. And we've, we've seen this stupid battle against masculinity for years. Have you ever wonder, like back in the 90s and the early 2000s, every father on TV was portrayed as a moron. Like they don't know what's going on. This has been setting the stage for where we are now because, oh, we laughed at it. The dad is stupid. Ha, ha, ha. And now everybody hates men. And men don't even want to be men. And did y'all miss the fall of Rome where we started feminizing men and then that caused the collapse of their society? Where are we at in America? Where's the men? Where's the men? On the front row, one of y'all. And hey, nobody else said anything. Where's the men? Hey, there we are, yeah. <laughs> we look at men putting on dresses and makeup, and we think that's the dumbest thing, and it's ugly, and it's disgusting, and it's fake. Where, where are the women trying to dress up like men? Y'all notice that? It's all men putting on dresses. Where are the women? I'm not saying I want that. Dear God, no. But has anybody caught, caught on to that? We wanted this whole big transgender movement. And I don't know if you know this. If you don't know your Bible, let me enlighten you. And you can go back and watch it in the other sermon. Every Bible or every demon in the Bible, guess what they refer to themselves as? They and them, and we, and us, 
There you go. Take that home, put it on your fridge, and realize you're fighting the demonic forces. That's what the transgender movement is. It fills the building or it empties the building. But we look at men putting dresses on and makeup on. I can't even put chapstick on without feeling weird. Like, I don't know about y'all. I don't like nothing. Ask Kelsey, like, lotion? Uh, no, I don't like lotion on my hands. It's weird. But we think, as if they're fooling anybody, too. Like, you look at them, you're like, bro. Literally, bro. Yeah, the Adam's apple. You want to go down the conspiracy theory? Look at the women celebrities that have wet Adam's apple. I just shattered somebody's entire existence. <clears throat> but we, we look at men, I got to get back to it. We, we look at men dressing up and we're like, wow, that's fake. That's disgusting. And yet we have so many Christians and so many pastors coming in and holding up this Bible, this book, the Holy Word of God, and doing nothing with it, pretending just as much as a man putting on a dress, acting like you're a Christian and you don't know anything about Christ. You got people on TikTok saying, this is not the word of God. This isn't God inspired. It was just written by man. And they're leading people in churches. And people eat it up. It tickles the ears. It makes you feel good. And the thing is, they're probably not getting shut down because they are God's judgment on them for not truly seeking the truth, for wanting their ears tickled. Just because there's teaching and there's preaching doesn't mean, any, it doesn't mean anybody's reaching. It doesn't mean anybody's actually listening. I don't want to sound crass, so hear my heart on this. I don't care. <clears throat> hear me. <laughs> Trying to find the, oh, whatever. There's more than uh, one hole in your body for sin to get into. I'm not just talking about what's between your legs. Your eyes and your ears are the window to your soul. So when you're spending all your time watching the evil of the world, listening to the evil of the world, soaking up all the songs that you don't even know the I don't listen to the lyrics. I like the beat. And then you look up the words and they're like, oh, hail Satan, praise Lucifer. And you're like, whoa! But the problem is, we're not reaching people with teaching, we're not reaching people with preaching because our ears are clogged and our eyes are closed and it has closed our hearts so we don't know the truth when we see it because we're listening to the world too much. We're putting too much Taylor Swift on instead of listening to godly music. We're putting too much, oh man. You got too much Eminem and you need to get more Michael and Math or uh, Micah and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Put the, put the Bible on and listen to the Bible more than you listen to the crap that you're filling your life with and thinking it's feeding your soul. I mean, think about it. Anybody that has lived in that and listened to that long enough and when you get out of it and you go and listen to it again, you're like, how did I even like this? It's like, a, like, like uh, I remember going on the Daniel fast years ago with just the fruits and veggies for uh, 21 days. And I remember once that ended, I went to have a Snickers. And I was like, I couldn't even finish it. I had like two bites because it was just so much sugar, but something that felt good when I was eating it up. And when I finally got out of it long enough, and stripped that sickness from my body, and then you go back and try to go back into it, you realize, whoa, this actually isn't for my benefit. It might make me feel good, but I'm gonna be walking around a little bit fatter than I was before, and not in a good way. And the point of your testimony, I truly believe when Jehoshaphat goes out, and he turns their hearts to them, turns their hearts back to God, that he shared his testimony because he already sent people out to teach the word. But now he's come back, he's defeated, he did the wrong thing. 
And I think he went out and he said, guys, I had this wrong. I had this wrong. This is a lot more real than you think it is. I messed up. I got hooked up with the wrong person. I messed up. I'm still here. Thank God he's not done with me, but I, I messed up. And he goes out and he, he gets judges in the land. And the first thing it says that he told them, verse 6, consider carefully what you do because you are not judging for mere mortals but for the Lord who is with you whenever you make a verdict. Amen. Now, let the fear of the Lord, let God's reverence and awe be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord, our God, there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. Or bribery. And he sends priests out later in the chapter. I can't see. Verse 10. And when he tells them, he says, you are to warn them not to sin against the Lord. Otherwise, his wrath will come on you and your people. Do this and you will not sin. Amen. Judge carefully. For you're judging for God, not just mere men. How you speak to someone, how you judge them, and how you teach them. You're doing it for God. And warn them not to sin. Warn them not to sin. Always. Warn them not to to sin. Be judging for God, but don't be corrupt. Don't be corrupt. In Matthew 7, probably one of the most well-known verses of the Bible apart from John 3, 16. Verse 1, do not judge. And that's where half the world stops. Don't judge or you too will be judged. Next verse. For in the same way that you judge others, I feel like I'm doing the, you will be judged, <laughs> and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Next verse. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Go back to verse one. Do not judge Or you too will be judged. Now, the problem is, leave that up for a moment. The problem is, this is about, it's not, it's not judgmentalism. If you study this and look into it, it's actually forbidding judgmentalism. This is about moral discernment. Moral discernment. To be discerning of people, to warn them of their sin, but instead, you can take it down. Thank you. Instead, what it has become in the church too often, instead of warning about sin, we have made it judging superficially, hypocritically, we've done harsh judgment, self-righteous judgment, and untrue judgment, false witness. Opposing sin is not the problem. We look at John the Baptist, who was not afraid to say what needed to be said. Repent. Repent. And he talks to Herodias and warns them of how their relationship is not godly. They need to separate and repent. And in return, what happens is he is imprisoned and beheaded. But we have taken in the church opposing sin and changed it to opposing others 
because of our personal preferences and our own personal standards. You're supposed to be discerning, but based off of God's word, God's truth, not your pride, not your prejudice, not your preferences, but in the provided, unmatched, mighty, matchless, God-breathed word revealed in scripture. Judge by the book, and if it's not by the book, shut your mouth. I've had enough of it. I've had enough of it. There's so many people that come into church and they immediately leave because someone judges how they're dressed, how they look, how they smell, how they act, how they talk. We say judgment-free zone like we're Planet Fitness. And then like Planet Fitness, we provide nothing for their betterment and set pizzas out. So they go in there to work out. They come to church to work out their sin. And the only thing that gets worked out is more frustration because someone judges them right out of the building. It is our job to be fishers of men. Jesus, hold on. Jesus cleans the fish. We catch them, he cleans them. That's it. That's the only way it goes. It is not your job to tell somebody how to clean up. It's Jesus' job through sanctification to do it. It's not your job to judge them because you've been walking with God for 50 years and somebody just got saved 50 minutes ago and if they don't get this tract and they don't follow this preacher and they don't listen to this type of music and they don't get this translation of the Bible and they don't read this many books and they don't read uh, Leviticus and they don't study enough, suddenly... You're not a real Christian, and we're going to judge you right out of the room. You just got saved, and I'm expecting you to stop having sex, to cut everything off with your boyfriend, to stop having drugs, as if something that has gripped your life for 30 years can be wiped away in three minutes. Can it be? Yes. Absolutely. Can it be? Yes. Is that often the case? No. No. Going back to Exodus, God pulls them out through Moses, the rejected prophet, the one who wanted nothing to do with it because he stuttered. He was afraid of man. He was afraid of men's opinions. And it was so bad that God had to use Aaron to also speak. But he gets pulled out of Exodus or uh, pulled out of Egypt. And they come to the water. There's a barrier between them and their blessing. And the only way they're getting through that is with God. They can't go around because their past is coming up behind them. The enemy is breathing down their neck. And what do they do? Complain instantly. Why did you bring us out of here so we could die? And then once they get through that, and God delivers them through that, here's the promised land. Let's go check it out. Oh, there's some big people there. We're like grasshoppers. And they spend what should have been like two weeks or 21 days, whatever it is, they spend, instead of the short amount of time traveling to the promised land, they spend 40 years trying to get somewhere that they weren't ready for. And that's what we do with new Christians. I'm ready for a walk with Jesus. And then here comes... What were we talking about the, the, the other week? It's like the, 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 the new believers to the five-year mark is so crucial, so crucial, because it grips you. God grips you, and he starts the fire in your soul, and you've got the passion, and you're ready to go, and I'm ready to get to work, and I'm ready to serve, and I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to do that. And then there's that gap where things can kind of fall off, and we can slip into being complacent, 
And then we get the elder brother aspect. I've been here for 15 years. You're only here for, for five minutes. Let me mentor you. But in reality, it's I want you to act how I want you to act. And I think I've got a better handle on this God thing than you do. And we've got a lot of scripture with no heart connect in order to reach to someone and speak to someone. And instead, we judge them out of their walk. We judge them out of the building. Because I've got this figured out. I've been doing this a long time. We're the elder brother in Luke 15. I've been here the entire time. Why are we celebrating the guy coming back? We've completely neglected the word of the Lord that says there is literally a party in heaven when one sinner comes and God in heaven rejoices over the lost coming back. But we think that, hey, they're here now. The first thing we need to do is write out a whole list of rules and make sure they follow those rules. If you want to get to God, you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this. And we missed the part of scripture where Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. I don't see rules in that line. I see rest. I don't, I know I sound angry today, but I promise I'm not. I, I, I can't, I can't stand it, guys. I can't. I literally, physically, it makes me sick to watch the state of the church when new believers come in or atheists come in and people are hungry to know, is this real? And we spit them out of our mouth before they can even get a word in edgewise. We take judge not unless you be judged and we think, I've got the righteous judgment. I've got this, I can make this. And instead of pointing, I'm not saying don't point people's sins out. Hear my heart. It's not about pointing people's sins out. Are we supposed to? Yes. The problem is we're not doing that anymore. We're judging them based on how we think this Christian walk is supposed to look. Across the board. If you don't like it here, go on our website. I've got other churches listed. It's about collaboration, not competition. I don't care if you want to come here or somewhere else as long as you are getting biblically fed. Do I want you here? Of course. But we're all working for the same boss in different departments. And instead, we've got now just so much infighting over denominations. And we've created all of these external rules, and we don't realize the reality is the Pharisee spirit is alive and well within the church. And Jesus came and spoke against it, but we brought it back and put it under a new name, and called it being our brother's keeper. Right, that's right. Huh. God, this is heavy today. I did not know this was where this was going. <clears throat> Jesus sat with sinners. And if you go on TikTok, they'll say, he didn't say anything about it. He just sat with the sinners. You can be gay, you can be a lesbian, you can have threesomes, you can do all the drugs you want, you can do all the alcohol you want, and not that drinking is a sin, but moderation. Moderation. You don't need an entire bottle of of Jack Daniels on Friday night. And he he sat with the sinners. And like I said last week, the first persecution that comes is from religious folk in the building. Why am I talking about it so much? Because this is where it begins. Y'all, you've got to grasp and you've got to realize that some people's first and only 
time that they will be exposed to Jesus or the gospel is through you. It's through you. And which line will they be in in eternity because of how you treated them, how you responded to them, or how you reacted to them? Did you coddle their sin because it was too uncomfortable to point it out? Did you judge them completely out of the room so that they thought they were condemned before they realized that Christ came down and freed them from that sin? Which line will they be in? Looking at you and saying, thank you. Or looking at you and saying, I don't know, is this your fault? I wanted to know about Jesus, but I went to church. They hated me for it. I found that the world, the bar room, the club was more loving than God's people. That God Chasers book, I got that. That thing's ridiculous. Thank you. By Tommy Tinney. Write that down and go get it. Holy moly. Unreal. I gotta move on. Unreal. These people, it's about the hunger for God, wanting God enough that you would. Oh, man. We want Jesus, but. Jesus, but. Jesus, but. Instead of Jesus. It, it, this has to be so real to you, for you, in you. That if you had nothing else, like Job, you had nothing but Christ, that's enough. Amen. That's enough. Yes. Amen. That has to be enough. The rest is icing on the cake. Yeah. On. But if your focus is on the cake, right. <laughs> you got it wrong. Yeah. Jesus is enough, Amen. and he has to be Enough. I want to read one more passage. Because this is my heart. Oh, my Bible says prayer for revival. Directly connected to this passage. I read this in that book and it immediately stirred in my spirit. We need revival. Revival. And we talk about it, and we pray about it, and we say we want it, and I am repeating myself. We say we want it, but I don't think we're truly ready for it because we don't grasp that it starts here first. The movement for revival will start in you before the building fills up and more people are coming. I'm praying, after reading it in the book, I am praying and believing that this will be such a hot spot for heaven, a hot spot for the Holy Spirit, that those driving by will pull in simply because something is tugging at their heart and they realize there's something going on there. I don't know what, but I've got to get in the building and I've got to find out. Because what happened in this book, this pastor, pastor was preaching over and over and eventually it was just going through the motions. And he goes to... Uh, a friend of his church and they preach and something felt like God like it, it felt like God was about to do something and he goes back a second week and he goes back the third week they started at 8 a.m. y'all think I went long they didn't end until 1 in the morning on Monday no worship after a moment and he didn't even stand up to speak because the glory of God, the presence of God came so thick in the room that people just came in, fell down on their knees, weeping and repenting. He said that there was people that couldn't even make it in the door and they had to literally, the ushers had to drag people out of the way. So more people that were driving by just randomly saw it and felt something there, pulled in the parking lot, came in and revival started simply because the people were hungry for God. And I keep saying we're starving for truth, but are you hungry for God? 
instead of cotton candy Christianity that's rotting your teeth out, that's rotting your soul out, and you're completely got a distended belly full of stuff that doesn't even make sense, and you just need to vomit it up, bury your face down into the dirt, look up to heaven and say, God, something's wrong. I need you. I need you to move in me, renew my heart, renew my mind, and bring me into your presence. Make yourself real to me. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. Second Chronicles 7. Where we need to be. Verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves will humble themselves, will humble themselves, will humble themselves. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I told you in week one, Christianity is dying in this country. It has already been wiped out from its birthplace in the Middle East. Where Islam is there, Islam is now here, it will probably become the prevailing religion. I do not seek to scare you, but the reality is we are in the last days. Your time, my time is running out. Yes. That's right. <clears throat> that doesn't scare me. Y'all quiet like you're afraid. You should be rejoicing. Yes. Our time is almost up. We are about to be in heaven in eternal glory in the new creation with a new mortal body, without back pain, without sickness, without your voice going out, without immorality, without depression, without bitterness, without drugs, without pain. You're about to be in glory. You should be celebrating that time is almost up. But what breaks my heart is the church doesn't realize this enough and we're too comfortable and we don't want to save other people that are on the wrong path. Right. Our land is dying. America is in hell. Because we just wanted to be left alone. I don't care if the gay people can get married. We just want to be left alone. Oh, now if they want to get a cake, we can shut that business down who has the right to refuse business, but we'll shut it down because it disagrees with the gay agenda. The pastor stands up and he speaks out against the LGBTQ movement, the demonic movement, and he gets kicked off of TikTok Live because of hate speech. America is in hell, and we invited Satan in and celebrated it. But God says, if my people who are called by my name, and you are called, and those who are called are also justified, and those who are justified are glorified. So you are called, you are chosen, and if you will humble yourself under his mighty hand and pray and seek his face and turn from your wicked ways. Return to him. Then he will hear from heaven, forgive your sin, and heal your land. You want America to get better? Do this. 
do this. God, break me, break us, break the sin off, ring the sin out, ring the lust out, <laughs> ring the bitter, ooh, the devil's trying to stop me now, <clears throat> ring the coughing out, ring the sickness out, ring the bitterness out, ring everything out of my life that is not of your glory, strip it off of me, and anoint me through your fire for the job that I've got to do so the people who are called by his name will hear his name and return to him because they know God is in them. Stand on your feet, please. Let's close this bad boy so we can get some food. My mama made brownies and y'all ain't getting any of them. (coughs) Don't, y'all don't worry. I just want to pray for y'all today. so tired of that. Here we go. Excuse me for a minute. But I've got a cough drop to put in my mouth. The reality is this. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pray. You can bring the lights down. We need to seek his face. The Bible talks about how the problem is how we can look in a mirror and walk away and instantly forget our reflection. We have so neglected God's word for entertainment and for feel-good little fluffy cotton candy, Sour Patch Kids sermons. We don't know what his face looks like. We don't know what his face looks like. Because we don't even know what his word sounds like. And the minute it starts getting preached, we reject it and walk out of the room. Because it's too convicting. I don't know who needs to hear this. One day the conviction stops. One day the conviction stops. For some of y'all, under the sound of my voice, whether here or in in the chat room, whatever, one day the conviction stops. That's not a good thing for some of you. It stops when we enter eternity. My heart is so for the lost. I'm tired of seeing the church reject the lost like this gospel is just inclusive for only the people that are already in it. As if God's children are not wandering the earth, being prisoners of warfare, being held captive by demonic and evil dark spirits. And we just want to keep this to ourselves like it's a secret. Break that off of us, God. We need to be humbled. We need to be humbled. We need to pray. We need to seek his face. Because if we want to hear from heaven, then we need to return to a heart for heaven. If you want to hear from heaven, you need to return your heart to heaven. You've been broken. You've been crushed. You're sitting in the bathroom, throwing up in a toilet, feeling the conviction begging God to make it stop, pulling the gun out of your mouth, begging God to make it stop, but you haven't returned your heart to heaven. Because you want God to deliver you out of it instead of delivering you into him. So this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed and a message that was completely different than I imagined. 
we need to return to a heart for heaven, a heart for the broken, a heart for the lost, a heart full of authority and the boldness that is the Holy Spirit. We know the scripture. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us and we do nothing except want to bring donuts to church. And it's time to go out into the world to punch hell back in the mouth, to deliver people from the mouth of darkness, to deliver people from the dominion of darkness, to deliver people from Satan's kingdom, to pull their souls out of eternal damnation and deliver them into the kingdom of heaven, to tell them that they are a child of God, they are loved, they are wanted, they are sought after. It's time. God, the church, has all but programmed you out of its existence to keep things on a timetable. And God, I break that off of us. I cast that down in Jesus' name. And I say, hijack it whenever you want, Holy Spirit. Wreck our agendas. Wreck our platforms. Wreck the American church and rebuild it into what you want it to be. It's already rubble. It's time to build it back for the kingdom of God, to let it be a voice crying in the wilderness, to let it be a light in the darkness, God. Return our hearts to you. Return our hearts to you. We need a heart for heaven. Not just to hear from it. We need a heart for it. Because that will change If you need prayer today, I'm not giving a typical altar call. If you need prayer, if you want prayer, if something is stirring in you, I implore you, don't wait for tomorrow. Come running down to the altar. If someone is blocking you, push them out of the way. Find your way up front and get here and let's get you prayed for. Let's get you equipped for what you're going back into. God, stir their hearts. If you need prayer, come forth now. Don't wait for me to end. There's not going to be a song after this. There's not going to be a typical call. Don't hold back. Don't be white knuckled. Be bold. Come forth. Come on. I love you. Come forth. Come. Look what heaven is doing. Open your eyes. Look what God is doing. Mitch, come, come up here. Kelsey, not on stage. I don't know who else is out there. Mitch, can you can you pray for them? Kelsey, where are you at? Yes, you, the, my wife. <laughs> Come forth. Stephen. It's the teacher calling on the classroom right now. Come up here, Tyler. And you, Sylvia. I'm just kidding. Pray for them, please. Can you pray for them? I'm not worried about that. Just for a minute. I know this is completely different, and some of y'all are probably mad at me for calling on you. But I feel led to stir up the boldness and to ask you to pray for them. If there's anyone else out there that you feel led to pray, please come forth and pray for these people. It is time for the church to be a community again. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ in eternity. We rely too much on the staff or the volunteers at the church. I want to see you come forth and pray for these people because they are in it with you just as you are.
For those of you who came up and listened to me, I, I, I thank you for being bold. Father, Father, your children are broken. Your children are broken. And we need you now more than ever. Stir up our hearts. Stir up the boldness. Stir up the courage. Stir up the compassion, God. I pray for each of these, Lord. I pray for each of these, Lord. Whatever their heart needs, that you know and they don't even know yet, I pray your will be done. Every broken heart crying out for you, God, that you heal them. Those that feel the sting of their sin, the conviction of their sin. And if that's you, there's still time to come up here. Today is something different. We are returning to the intention of the church. And going after this intentionally for a purpose. If you don't know God. And church, pray this with me. This is not a magical prayer. But if you feel that pull from the Holy Spirit, don't hold back. Give him your all. It will be worth it. It will not be easy but it will be worth it. If everyone can repeat after me, for the benefit of those that want to renew their faith or those that are first coming back to God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your Son who left glory to become a mortal, to die for my sins, and to rise again on his own. Jesus, you are my Lord and my Savior. I pray that your will be done in my life and that you break me for your glory. Amen. Amen. If you just accepted God as your Lord and Savior, if you just accepted Jesus, church, rejoice with me and pray for these people. If you just... Look what God is doing. Heaven rejoices at the return of one sinner. You guys can... Be seated if you want. God is changing things. Mitch, thank you. Kelsey, thank you. Mark, Tyler, whoever else I call, thank you. God is changing things in this church. This is unrecognizable from where it was a year ago, I would say, in a year from now. We cannot even fathom. Have grace. Have mercy. No judging. No judging. Where they are in their walk, how they look, no judging. Hug them, shake their hand called Family Church for a reason. We are the body of Christ, one family from different generations, different cultures, different places in the world. We are one with God. 
As a Christian, your identity is not American. It is not African-American. You are not African. You are not Mexican. You are a child of God. That is it. I do not mean to come against your culture. There's nothing wrong with that. But you are a child of God. First and foremost. Beautiful. Amen. Beautiful. Let me pray one more time. And we have the potluck. We will need a few minutes to set the room up, unless they already did it, I don't know. Come and stay. Come and eat. Come and commune with your family. I really want to thank each and every one of you that stayed for not only the entirety of it, but stayed for the invitation church culture wants to rush out the door the minute the lights go down and it is the most the most important part for people to pour their hearts out to God and repent and we run out in order to beat the red light so thank you Father I pray for more boldness for more courage I thank you for these saints for these brothers and sisters that have come forth to chase you. God, I pray you continue to break our our stuff, to break our sin, to break off our shame, and to anoint us more for your glory, to give us more fire. God, pour your spirit out. There's worship and there's word. What we need is the wind. Holy Spirit, breathe. God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he said, prophesy, son of man. And tendons and muscles came onto the rattling bones, but there was no life in them. And the moment that God breathed, the same word from Genesis when he breathed into Adam. Holy Spirit, Breathe into your church right now. Pour yourself out into this church right now. Give us another Pentecost and reignite the fires that is within us. Father, bring us back to life. I prophesy to these people, these dry bones, let them live for you, Jesus, like never before. And in the mighty and in the matchless and in the majestic name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, be alive, be free. Amen. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.